My name is Paul Larham, uh, Flying Time, Flying Instructor. I uh, apologise for the switch around in the schedule this morning because I was flying and uh, things backed up a little bit and Dave stepped in with his material. And, uh, but anyway, I'm here and the topic is VFR navigation. VFR navigation is actually a very big topic. We've got a whole uh, manual on it that we give our students and I'm not in half an hour going to cover all of VFR navigation. So what I'm going to do is really have a look at some of the uh, things on the topographical, topographical chart that we use and a little bit about map reading. Uh, cover a little bit about route planning without going into <coughs> all the mathematics that's involved in it because there are easy ways of doing it. Um, and I've got uh, a little video of the kind of things that can go wrong and um, when I get to that I'll explain this is not an unusual occurrence uh, and I'll talk about the kinds of things that will happen that happen all the time. Uh, last year, 2010, no sorry, actually August this year, um, there were 50 infringements of controlled airspace by people trying to do VFR navigation yeah. and getting it wrong. Just in one month, 50 infringements of controlled airspace. So uh, I'm going to start off. The topographical charts, there are essentially three charts we're using in the UK. Two of them are from the CAA. Uh, one's a one to 500,000 chart, which is probably the most common that we're using in light aircraft. There is a quarter mil chart, one to 250,000 chart as well. Um, tends to be used by helicopter pilots, maybe micro light pilots, glider pilots, people that are flying a little bit slower and just want that larger scale. Um, and there is also another commercial um, Jepson uh, range of charts that cover the UK, but they also cover the rest of Europe all in the same format. If you look around Europe, every National Aviation Authority will publish an ICAO compliant chart, but they all look different. The, the Jepson charts all look the same. So what I'm going to talk about here, um, it really is based on the UK half a mil 500,000 chart. So uh, on the chart, I'm going to show you a picture of what the chart looks like, but we've got a couple of legends on it. It is a, topograph it's a topographical chart, um, so it has uh, contours, elevations, cultural data, um, and there is a, a legend box in the bottom right hand side with all of this stuff. But because we're using it for aviation, we also have uh, an aviation overlay on it. Uh, and on the left hand side of the chart we use, we have all this aeronautical information. Uh, the validity of the information, maximum elevation figures, which are quite handy when you're flying around quite low and uh, magnetic variation which we're going to need for some of our planning, for our flight planning, um, depiction of what aerodromes look like, gliding sites, hang gliding sites, parachuting slide sites. We have uh, controlled airspace and how that's depicted. You've got to remember we're talking about um, an aviation chart so we're not interested simply in a two-dimensional chart, it's three-dimensional and we have airspace above us to the sides of us, maybe below us. Uh, and that has to be depicted on the chart. So uh, up here, different classes of airspace and the different way they're depicted on the chart. Um, and then you've got air navigation obstacles and so on and so on and so on. And actually, there's more reference information about danger areas and all the rest of it, which I didn't get on the picture, but it's further to the right of this uh, legend box. There is another um, down here published by Nats, half a mil scale. There is another... Um, box on here which contains all of the radio frequencies for the, all the aeronautical radio stations, all the airfields, uh, but I haven't shown you that. So, um, this is what the chart looks like and we're go I'm going to go through a bit of route planning in a minute on uh, a route from Shoreham to Lashenden. Shoreham's down here, it's an aerodrome and it has this dotted circle around it, that's an aerodrome traffic zone. Lashenden up in the top right hand corner Similar. But you I call that it is called Headcorn Lashenden. On the chart, it's Lashenden. Yeah. You call it Headcorn Lashenden. Doesn't really. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you look on the chart, it says Lashenden Headcorn. Oh, yes. It does say. Um, there's a few things to point out on the chart. Um, at Shoreham here, we're not in controlled airspace, and I'll explain where the controlled airspace is in, in a moment. We're not in controlled airspace. The aerodrome has an air traffic zone outside of controlled airspace, but because we do have instrument approaches, um, it is, uh, the, these instrument approaches are marked on the 
the chart so that traffic that are not flying in controlled airspace are aware that there may be instrument traffic um, approaching this airfield. So that's what these symbols are. There are instrument approaches on both of our runways, um, both GPS and NDB approaches. And if you look at the one for Lashenden, you've got a little parachute symbol. It's a big parachuting center. So that's a, a beware up there. Right. Um, around the Shoreham area, there are a number of things called VRPs. There's a VRP there at Brighton Marina. There's one at Littlehampton. There's one at Washington. Uh, so visual reference point. Visual reporting oh, yeah. point. And there is another one over here somewhere at, uh, where is it? Lewis, wherever that is. There's one at Lewis yeah. as well. Um, those are the ones associated with Shoreham. And the way they're used at Shoreham, they are for traffic that may be joining here, giving a report to the controllers here about their position, where they are when they're calling for joining um, is that information. One, the Brighton one directly over the pier? The marina. Marina. That's the marina. The pier is oh, actually the just there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's the marina. So you, if you're coming in there, you'd say, yeah. I'm over so and so reference, and I would, the control tower know exactly where you they are. Know where they, they also know where we are because they have a little gadget up there. So when you make a radio transmission, it gives them a pointer. Oh, yeah, so it points to the gadget. So you can't lie. I'm afraid they're very old fashioned with some of the stuff I do. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they, they know when you're making the call, but they don't know how far out you are. Yeah. Um, so these, these visual reference points, or reporting points, sorry, um, are used for the traffic coming in, if you're coming in from the east, west, or wherever. Those are the points where you would call the uh, air traffic control here. Um, the problem with them is that if it's a point, and if there are everybody lots of people, everybody wants to fly there. So we tend not to actually fly right over them. We fly to the north of beam or wherever, and we give a position report based on a reference to that that point. Okay, so uh, because we have um, control uh, in the tower, a controller in the tower, we have all these points. Lashington doesn't have anything as um, exotic as that. Lashington just has, um, I'm not even sure if it's just a radio service, I think it's just a radio service. So there is no controller at all at Lashington at all. All you're going to get if you call them is maybe the airfield information, the wind direction, runway in use, and the out of meter seven. To and the rest is up to you. Yeah. Uh, but you would make calls so that people know where you are. Okay, so um, on the chart, we've got things like gliding sites marked, hang gliding sites, um, mast towers, chimneys. Uh, we have controlled airspace, and that color there, we looked at the legend, would be um, class A. And it says London Terminal Management Area. Class A from 3,500 feet and above. So if I want to fly over here, I must be below 3,500 feet. Otherwise, if I'm VFR, I must be. Otherwise, if I'm not VFR, I need to be talking to London. Um, but that steps down as we get towards GAT 2,500. So we wander further north. Uh, that's Class A as well because it's still the London uh, terminal area. When we get here, it steps down to 1,500 feet up to two and a half thousand feet because at two and a half thousand feet we've got this area so we're thinking uh, three-dimensional stepping down um, but the color of that is different and the reason that is it's a different class of airspace it's not class A it's class D as a VFR pilot I could fly in class D as long as I was talking to them and I had their permission to go in there in class A I'm not permitted you to fly to control yeah so you can fly in there. absolutely yeah as long as they know you're coming, they can directly... Drive well, they may refuse your entry. It depends on yeah. what traffic. But um, it's a control service in there, and it's up to them to uh, either permit you in or not. Uh -huh. They will always try and accommodate you, but yeah. um, they are running a service around that airport. Yes. So um, we have three-dimensional chart. It is stepping down towards Gatwick, and when we get uh, in this area here, right. that's all the way to the ground. Yeah. Awesome. Interestingly... Uh, an A, control area, ma terminal management area, are from uh, levels above the ground. When it goes from the ground, it's a, it's a control zone. A zone is from the ground. So that's the Gatwick control zone. It's denoted CTR. There's not a Z, Z in it. Yeah. So that goes from surface to 2,500 feet. So um, there are some issues with this. If we're going to fly from Shoreham to Lashenden headquarters, 
because potentially we would be, depending on the elevation, the, the, the altitude we choose to fly, we could be flying through some of this. So it's going to have a planning uh, impact on our, on our flight. Um, what else should I mention about this at this time? So we talked about the VRPs, we talked about the aerodrome traffic zones. There are a couple of other things on the chart uh, for planning purpose, purposes that will assist. We have these figures, and they're in the uh, aeronautical legend. These are maximum elevation figures. So what we have is half degree boxes. You can see the lines here, a line here, a line here, and a line down there. Those are half degree <coughs> boxes. And within that box, what that number says is that's the highest, that's the maximum elevation of any obstacle yeah. in that box. You will not necessarily find anything that's 1,200 feet because there are obstacles on these charts that up to 300 feet that will not be marked. So the chart has to assume that they're on the highest elevation in there. If it's um, uh, a high point, 700 feet, 800 feet or something, that there could be an obstacle on the top of another 300. So we've got a, on that ridge over there, we've got an 813 foot point, high point. That 813 foot high point could have a 300 foot mast on it. That takes it up to 1100 foot, but it's actually 813 foot. So if you round it up, we get 1200 feet. Is that including the safety height above the obstacle? No, we'll come to that in a moment. There are, um, a, there are two, there are two levels you're going to be concerned with when you find that high point. If it's on your track, um, we would normally put on, and we'll look at it when I do the planning. I'll, I've got a little planning sheet and show you how we're going to do that. Our minimum safe altitude, we would put on our uh, route plan. However, our, our minimum safe altitude is a thousand feet above that. Because we are flying VFR, that does not mean that is our minimum altitude to fly. We can fly lower. Uh, because rule five of the air navigation order says minimum level, you need 500 foot rule. So a 500 foot dome from any obstacle, building, animal or whatever. So that would be our lowest permissible VFR level, which could be 500 foot below my minimum safety altitude. The reason I put the minimum safety altitude on my planning is that we may fly into cloud and the minute we fly into cloud we must be above that minimum safe altitude. So we would climb to that doesn't mean to say I have to fly above it when I'm visual. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I said this is a big topic. I've used 15 minutes and I'm still on my... <laughs> so we'll see how this goes. Okay. Um, and I haven't even drawn a line on the chart yet. <laughs> um, so I can use that. If, if that is um, just a bit inconvenient for me to, to use that level and my chart doesn't, my, my route actually doesn't go near that higher point, there is another method of determining my minimum safe altitude and that is five miles either side of track. Uh, so I could put a 10 mile wide ruler on there, which my little plastic ruler is, and lay it along my track line and look at the high points in there and then decide on a different minimum safe altitude. Okay. Um, I think I've done that one to death. We can move on. Okay, so I've, what I've done here, I, I could draw a straight line from Shoreham to Lashenden. Um, however, um, I'm going to be doing a plan, which is a dead reckoning plan, and I need a starting point. And, and when I take off from Shoreham, I'm going to have to climb, and I won't be doing a planned speed necessarily for my uh, dead reckoning. And I might want to start en route, on track, at my altitude, my planned altitude, from a known reference point. So in this case, I might have used Brighton Marina. Um, and where I put this point, where I'm going to start on, might depend on the runway we're going to depart from. So if I was departing on this runway here, 2-0, southerly, um, that might be a good point to put on there. But if you remember what I said about visual reference po points before, about everyone goes there, um, sometimes these are not the best places to, to put your, your uh, start from. Um, if I was on the other runway, I'd have to find somewhere else because I'd be cutting across joining traffic to get there and actually there's a, a straighter line that I could draw uh, but still have a reference point to fly from. Okay? Oh, if I look at that, if I take that route, I'm not actually going to be concerned, well I am going to be concerned about the three and a half thousand foot Class A. 
Yeah, yeah, well, as we get to Heathfield there, in the middle of just where the arrow is in the middle of that track, you see we go into um, Class A airspace if we're above 3,500 feet. 3,500. Yeah, so, so I could do that route and plan below 3,500, and that would be okay. Although I am coming at that point at Heathfield quite close to the 2,500 foot. And if I was off track by a little bit, I could wander into there. So maybe I'd choose 2,300 if I was going to do that. The other problem with that um, route as drawn is it goes right over the middle of a glider site that does cable launches up to 2,600 feet. Right, and that's before Heathfield, you see oh, the yes, G goes, right, goes glider, right over there. So maybe that's not a good idea either. Could you uh, inform your coming or... or well, is it, your job it would be common courtesy. Way? It would be common courtesy not to interfere with their gliding activities, because yeah. uh, uh, you know if you're coming and you're going to go over the top. Even if they know, that means they have to stop gliding. They have to stop launching, um, and we don't have to do that. We don't have to be a nuisance, and we don't have to um, put ourselves in danger from a cable launch as well. So, um, for this exercise, I picked a different routing. Would be to Dean Land. Oh, yeah. That's what might go over Dean Land. Uh, yeah, but Dean Land's an airfield with people taking off and landing. Yeah. Don't need to do that. So what I've done here, I've picked another landmark that I can identify. Um, this is the junction between the A23 and the A27. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't say A23 or A27, but you sort of have to know these things. <laughs> But it's a motorway, it's a junction, it's a big junction on a big road. Uh, on a chart I can see it's a junction on a road. And um, when I get there, um, there are, there's some clues that would give me a gross error check to say this is really where I am. I am here and I can set my heading here and I can set my stopwatch off from here. Um, and I've got the high ground in front of me, I've got Brighton to the south and the coast, and I've got the road going north and I've got the road going to the east. So I could. I could work with that. You've got one little stretch with 2,500. Yeah, so we're going to go at 2,300 yeah. uh, or 2,100. The other, um, we, as I said, this is a big subject and we're not going to go into it. The other consideration would be weather and where the cloud is okay. and what the cloud base might be um, and what the cloud's doing. Um, so that may have a bearing on what level I pick. But well, let's assume we're going to be OK, maybe 2,100, 2,300, or something like that. So I'm already in my head getting around some of the planning issues that I need to deal with just by drawing a line on the chart. OK? So um, I'm going to take off from Shoreham, and I will be climbing the aircraft at A speed uh, in a, on a general heading towards that point. With um, that's far enough away for me to achieve the altitude I require and to turn on track and to be able to do my dead reckoning or whatever. Um, we're talking about VFR navigation. As I said, a big subject. I'm going to give you a little example of a dead reckoning plan, but of course there are other ways of doing VFR navigation. One is pilotage, which is simply following roads, rivers, railway lines, <laughs> landmarks. That works. Yeah, that's why it's well worth knowing your area you're flying over. Yeah. Um, and actually, you might use that in conjunction with dead reckoning as well, just to confirm that you are going where you want. And of course, uh, the previous presentation on radio navigation aids, you can use that to supplement your navigation. You'll still be VFR navigating using a chart. So I'm going to, there's a lot going on when I take off from shore. I'm, a, I'm climbing. Uh, I'm going to have to um, set a heading. I might have to change radio frequencies. I'm going to do after takeoff checks and all sorts of things. So I'm not going to be starting on track with my stopwatch at that point. That's why I'm going to go to that junction and get all this stuff sorted out so that I can concentrate on my navigation at that point. Um, when I leave Shoreham, I will change frequency and I will go to the Farnborough radar service and the frequency is also on the chart here. They provide a lower airspace radar service, but I'm not going to, they're not going to be um, guiding me with any radar direction, they're just going to give me information. But I will want to talk to them so they know where I am and what I'm doing, because they get nervous when people fly around this controlled airspace. <laughs> but they're monitoring every aircraft all the time, aren't they? Yeah, they're they are. Sure. When they inform you... Or... Well, they can only inform people about anything if you're talking to them, oh, yeah. and I'll show you an example later on of something that went seriously wrong that could have been avoided if it, people had been talking to them. Okay. All right. Planning, I need, I need to know a wind. 
so this is the bit that I'm not going to get too technical about. We're going, there are many ways of doing this, but I do need to know the wind because the wind, if I want to design ground track and I've got a wind, I've got a, I'm going to drift somewhere. I won't be flying. If I just set that track on my compass and I fly that track, uh, that heading, I won't fly that track because the wind will be blowing me off. So we need to do some calculations. It's also going to affect my ground speed because my indicated airspeed isn't going to be the same as my speed over the ground. This is the bit I'm not going to go into massive detail about. You're going to take this, is, but that's the, that's the puzzle we have to solve. Triangle of velocities. That's it, the triangle of velocities. That's what we have to solve. We do need to get the wind from somewhere, um, and the w place we will get the wind from is from the Met Office, and the Met Office have an a on their website, they have an aviation section. It's a subscription, it's not a subscription, you have to register, but it's free. Um, and when you register there, you, there are a number of forms you can get. This one, form 214, gives you spot winds where those lines cross, and you can interpolate a wind at 1,000 feet, 2,000 feet, 5,000 feet, gives you the wind, uh, wind strength, wind direction, wind strength, also gives you the temperature as well. So there's planning information there. There is an associated chart with this, which is Metform 215, which is seriously too complicated for this, <laughs> for, for, for this length of time uh, briefing. But that is just the general weather. It's a synoptic type weather chart with all kinds of um, uh, information about cloud uh, Wind, not winds, clouds, um, visibility, temperatures, and all sorts of things. Okay, so that's I'm gonna. That's part of the information I need to solve that problem. Many ways of solving it. We use a thing called a CRP one or a CRP five, which is some sort of circular slide rule thingy. Uh, really complicated, but we make our students use it because we really want to make them work. Uh, but there are easy ways of doing it. Uh, I've put a thing called an E6B. The American version of our CRP is an E6B but there are plenty of electronic E6Bs on the web. You just put in the wind, your indicated airspeed, and uh, the track, and it will calculate your heading for you and your ground speed. Um, I even have a little thing on my phone that does that for me as well. <laughs> but, you know, we put our students through hell with this CRP thing. <laughs> oh, no, I know how they feel. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we need the wind because um, we need to work out this triangle of velocities because we need to know what heading we're going to fly. So I'm going to start a plan now and I'll have a log and I'll start putting data into this log. There's some bits of data I already know and some I'm going to have to calculate. So I'm going from Shoreham, I'm going to uh, Lashenden, but I am going via this junction. So I've put the first leg to that junction and off my chart I had 1,200 as the maximum elevation figure, so I will put a minimum safe altitude of 1,000 feet above that, 2,200. Uh, if you look at this, you can see I've actually overlaid what this chart was originally had on there because even the best software, and this is a software I use for this is approved by NATS, National Air Traffic Services, makes a mistake. And I'll show you what that mistake is. And in fact, I'll go back to the chart and I'll show you what, what they've done. So. Here's the first leg of the chart, and you can see that if I were to put a, uh, a ruler on there and measure five miles either side of my track, um, that software came out with 1,600 feet would be a minimum safe altitude because it said there's an elevation of something like 600 feet. Well, actually, there's 666 there, and it picked 1,600. But what it didn't do is look five miles in front of my track as well. So five miles all around my track, um, then I've got this 800-foot thing, and um, so it assumed I'm only interested in either side of my track. Oh, I see that could be good. Yeah, so that's a piece of software that's approved. Um, so we didn't, so I overlaid that and I put the 2200 using the maximum elevation figure from the chart. So uh, what level am I going to go? I said 2100, 2300, but certainly below 2500 with a margin of error. So I picked 2200 just happens to be convenient because my minimum safe altitude is also 2,000. So if I got into cloud, I wouldn't have to worry about my altitude too much. Um, on that first piece to the, the A23 junction, I have to climb. So my indicated airspeed is rather low because I'm in my cli best climb speed. So I'm going to assume I'm climbing. I've put a track because I've drawn a line on the chart. And if I go back to that picture there, 
If I put a protractor on there and I measure that angle, that was my 0, 7, whatever it was I had. The problem is I'm measuring not magnetic um, track, it's a true track. Uh, and we're using a true track, and those winds on that wind chart I had earlier on are true winds as well. So we're going to do our calculation using true winds and true tracks. However, our airplane doesn't have anything that shows true anything. It has a magnetic compass. So we have to do some changes uh, before we actually decide what we're going to fly. OK. So I've put my indicated airspeed, I've put my true track on, and I've put the wind that I've interpolated from the Form 214. Um, OK, this has jumped ahead. This is, uh, this is the chart with the calculations. So then I've used my clever piece of software or my phone or whatever to work out a magnetic heading. What I've really done is I've worked out a true heading, uh, but on the chart, I need to now put the magnetic variation. And the magnetic variation is actually shown on the chart. So if I go back to the first chart picture, we may see it. We have, we have a dotted line here. That dotted line is our magnetic variation. If I take that down to the edge of the chart, it will say one and a half degrees. So I would take my true, uh, and that is one and a half degrees to the west. Um, I would have to steer one and a half degrees west from that to get my true. So I add that to my true heading to get a magnetic heading. So um, you can see there's a dotted line here. It goes right away across the chart. It's offset. These, these are true, this is the magnetic variation line. Okay. It's quite a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's, an, it's a degree and a half. I think that's a graphical... Yeah. Um, it's a degree and a half if you get to the bottom of the chart. And that will vary every year. So every time they publish a new chart, there is a different number on there. And you will use that number in your planning. So let's go back here. Oh, that was the one. So that's the data I know. I'm working out my magnetic heading. So I will use my little computer or whatever method to work out a true heading. I will add that variation to give me a magnetic heading. Uh, that computer will give me a, a ground speed. Uh, and I've measured the distance with my ruler on the chart. So I've got, I've got my heading, ground speed, distance from which I can work out time. So I'm going to do ETAs and all the rest of it. Yeah. So, uh, so this is the data I had, the minimum safe altitude, the level indicated airspeed, the track I'm going to fly, true track, uh, and the wind. So I filled it all in, worked it all out, uh, and again, this is the bit I'm going to abbreviate. I'm not going to show you how to work it out. It's all on a, on a computer or on a, on a web tool or on your phone or whatever. You can work these things out. Uh, and I've, I've got a time uh, for each of those legs. So it should take me four minutes to get to the A23 junction. Um, and then 18 minutes from that junction to Lashenden. Uh, and you can see the ground speed. I've got an indicated airspeed of 110 knots. My ground speed is 118 knots. Just one other thing that this thing doesn't explain is indicated airspeed and my true airspeed are two different things. But at low levels, they are essentially pretty close enough for me to do this. When I get higher, there is a big deviation between my true airspeed and the, what the instrument is telling me. Um, and there is another calculation to work that out as well. Okay. It's to do with their density, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, so I've, this, this thing has just put the indicated airspeed up, and we've worked out a, a ground speed from that. And at 2,200, that will work for me, because the amount of accuracy in this is it's sufficient. It will work. OK, so I've got a heading magnetic calculated from triangular velocities with whatever tool I've used. I've got a ground speed. I can use that tool again for that. I've got a distance and time I can calculate because I can do it longhand if I want, but I can use the, what, these computers. Distance is um, speed out, mm, speed, uh, whatever. D distance over speed for, to work out the time. Uh, and now I can, I've got two boxes I haven't filled in, the ETA and the ATA. Estimated time of arrival, actual time of arrival. Now, I need to know my takeoff time to work out what my estimated time is gonna be. So when I take off on my, on my log on the top up there, I will write the time down. When I've written that time down, I can write down an estimate for the A23 junction. Yeah. When I get to the S to A23 junction, I will write the actual time that I got there, which may be different because the winds may be not as forecast. Yeah. And when I've got the actual time, I will use that to calculate the estimate for 
Lashingdon. So I'll add the 18 minutes on to that. Um, if the actual times deviate from the, my estimates greatly, I may revise my estimate. Okay, so we've got so far, we've got a, a flight log that's sort of shaping up and we know what we're going to fly. And so that was the first leg and I've marked the turning point. We know how we're going to get there and we know what we're going to do when we get there. We're going to be at 2,200 feet on track for Lashingdon. Uh, and we have, uh, we've dealt with all of these pieces of airspace. Uh, we've avoided the gliding sites and um, that should work for us. On the second leg, um, this is a bit longer. It's 18 miles, 18 minutes or miles, what I can't remember, 18 minutes long. Um, 18 minutes at 118 knots, maybe 120 to round it up. So um, we need to check our progress en route. We, we need to do a bit of map reading here. Um, and the, we could just fly this heading accurately, or we could think we can fly this heading accurately, because there are a number of things that can go wrong on trying to fly this heading. The wing can change. We can accurately fly the heading. The instrument we use to fly the heading may be lying to us. Um, because we might be using a direction indicator, which is simply a gyro that we've aligned with a compass, and we've misaligned it, or it's drifted, or it's not very accurate, and we're flying that, relying on it, and we haven't cross-checked it with the compass, and we head off in a different direction. Uh, we could head off here, and I'm expecting to see along my track somewhere Uckfield, and I put a ring around it, but if I'd set off up here, I might think, well, Burgess Hill, we must be there. Yeah. Um, and then beyond Uckfield, I know to the right I've got Heathfield, and I would say Haywards Heath. So, you've got to so uh, and then the next thing, I'm in controlled airspace, and I'm one of the 50 infringements we had last August. Yeah. Okay, that's how it happens, and it happens frequently. So what I will do is I would have done a gross error check there, just to make sure things are in the right place. South coast is where it should be, uh, the motorway on my left, and the motorway going east, and. Uh, my compass and my well it's not it's planning it's planning knowing what you're going to do and knowing what you're looking for and also the, um, the procedural part of it making sure my compass and my direction indicator are aligned and they're yeah. telling me the truth um, and then knowing that the wind may not be exactly what it says so I do need to monitor my progress along this track so I've picked a couple of key landmarks uh, along the track they happen to be about a third of the way along this track um, so at one third, I'm going to be looking for Uckfield, and my stopwatch should tell me, because I'm 18 minutes, at six minutes, I should be seeing Uckfield. So my stopwatch is a very accurate navigation instrument. Um, so if I'm flying accurately, Uckfield might be, hopefully, where I expect it to be. Um, as I said, you can easily misidentify this, because if you set off in the wrong direction, I'd be, you know, my stopwatch would have told me Burgess Hill wasn't right. Yeah. Uh, but I might have missed that. I might have gone on to Hayward Heath and said, oh, Hayward Heath, we're at Upfield. Yeah. I see you all there. You've got that lake. Those lakes are the best navigational yep. error correction. Right, areas. so we'll talk about that. Those lakes are a unique landmark. There is no misidentifying those. These built-up areas, towns, railway lines, all the rest of it, there are, you can misidentify them. So when we try and identify them, I look at it, I, say, I won't just say, oh, that's Uckfield, because my stopwatch says it should be, and it looks in the right place. I will confirm it. I won't say that is Uckfield until I get there, and I can confirm that I've got a dual carriageway going around here. I've got a railway line going through here. I'll pick three things that will confirm that that is Uckfield, and it should tie in with my stopwatch. I will not make an assumption that just because I've flown for six minutes, we've hit Uckfield. Okay. Um, as I progress down my track, I might be on track or off track. Now, there's another subject I'm not going to talk about, is how you regain your track if you have a track error. Well, yeah, you're going to have, there are lots of different techniques for correcting your track and getting back onto track or getting to your destination on a new track. Uh, that is another subject on its own. We're assuming here that we are on track. Um, we're doing a bit of map reading. So um, if I go beyond Duckfield, um, I should expect to see the town Heathfield on my right, and there's a big mast there at Heathfield. Um, it's quite high, it's 1,000 feet above the ground. The mast itself, which I've overwritten, is about 495, nearly 500 feet high. I should be able to spot that. Well, I would be able to spot that at 2,200 feet. If I was at 5,000 feet, the chances are I would not see that. That would not show up. So um, if I'm looking for a mast at 5,000 feet and I don't see it and I start getting nervous, well, there's a simple reason I can't see it. It's just not going to be visible from 5,000 feet. You haven't got a, it's not 
Uh, you can't see it against the horizon. You can't. Not silhouetted. Exactly. So at 2,200, I will see that, and I will see Heathfield, and I will just confirm my progress along track. Um, that is 18 minutes, so six minutes I should be there. At 12 minutes I should be at Buell Water, which is those lakes, and you will not misidentify those. Those are a unique landmark, so I'm not that worried about picking three different things to confirm that that is Buell Water. Then I know I'm six minutes on from Lashenden. Uh, this is where it would get busy with frequency changes and planning approaches and all the rest of it, but I would continue flying my heading. Um, so that's how I would plan it and that's how I would fly it. I would read the map. Um, there are things that can go wrong. It's on my next slide. So what could go wrong? Uh, this is an example from July last year. Uh, there is a website uh, called Fly on Track uh, and it's it's there for, um, to help people understand the things that cause infringement of controlled airspace, and they publish some of the radar tracks. What I've done is I've taken a map and I've plotted what this student did. There's a student here who was flying from, I'll show you the plot first before the picture. He was flying from Earl's Cone, top right-hand corner, and he was trying to fly that blue track. He was going to Witham, and then he was going to fly from Whitton to the overhead of Stapleford and then on to either Southend or Rochester or whatever it was. So he was going to fly that blue track. What he actually did is fly the red track because he forgot. Yep, and you'll see why he did it. And he misidentified everything. He confirmed en route that everything was in place and everything was correct. Well, I can actually see. You can see how he did it. His mistake was right at the beginning, he failed to turn left onto his track. He continued on, misidentified Braintree for Whitton then flew on and then misidentified Bishop Stalford, said that was Chelmsford. And flew, uh, he, he started to get worried then because things didn't look right, so he did an orbit. And then he thought, okay, well, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, uh, but I can see that town there, so that must be Brentwood. <laughs> okay, so he identified Harlow as Brentford, then flew on. That was the point he decided to call Farnborough Radar because he didn't think this was right. And they gave him a, a transponder code and then they put him right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll show you the radar. I'll show you the radar trace for this. He looks like also, sir. He looks like he's following the road. Yeah, you but he used the road. road. But you see the road here on his blue track? He identified it there on his red track. Jesus, yeah. I can understand where he made his mistake. Yeah, so, you know. <laughs> so, ma'am. Yeah. It's a bloody stupid mistake to make. No, no, people do this all the time. This is, this is real. This is, happens all the time. I mean, I'm the yeah. Fly, but nowhere near as bad as that. Yeah. Well, I, fortunately, I haven't. I haven't yet, but I'm not going to say I never will. <laughs> so let me go and show you this radar thing. If, and let's hope this works. This is supposed to... No, it's not going to work like that. How do I get that to play? I have to double-click on it, I think. Yeah, that's going to play. Hopefully. Yeah. Seeing is believing. So he believed everything he saw. Yes, I, can. I see where you, exactly where it's coming from. It really is amazing. So the playback's paused. All these little spots, dots here with numbers on, are aircraft. And I don't know if this shows up really. So they've overlaid his original track from Earlscombe to Stapleford. That's, what he in, that's the planned route. He would have remained clear of the Stansted zone, which is now marked red. Okay, so there's a, you can, they've put the map on the back there, so you've got a reference. Now, now he's moving, he's, that circle, he's just taken off from Earl's Cone, and you can just see the dot moving around there. Uh, after climbing to 2,000 feet, he's supposed to turn slightly left to take up his heading, but he didn't. He levelled off, saw a town, and identified it as Whitton. In actual fact, it was Braintree. So you've got Whitton and Braintree showing up there, so he was flying off there. There he is. Uh, this is speeded up times eight because he was actually in the standard zone, standard zone for 15 minutes where they stopped all traffic. Yeah. This happened in America. They took yeah. the yeah, yeah, well, he didn't have a well, license to take away. <laughs> so there he misidentified the road. He thought that was the A12, it was the A120. Uh, and he plods on. Uh, it speeded up a little bit there. You can see him. He's now. He's well into the Stansted zone. <laughs> it's amazing stuff. There are lots of people that do this. This is 50 times it happened around the UK in August. And on the fly on track. 
this was a student on a solo. What was well, we'll have a conversation about that because. Um, I, so he gets to Bishop Stalford. He's misidentified it as Chelmsford because he did the orbit, he spotted it, and he's heading off now in the direction of Stapleford. But he, he noticed the dual carriage, took a turn to the left, M11 going south. <laughs> so here we go, he's still going on. Yeah. At some point, he does a 180 after. Um, yeah, there he is. So now he decides things aren't what they should be, so he does a 180 turn to have a look around. That's where he spots Harlow. There he goes, in, in a circle, in the zone. Okay, so he spots Harlow, thinks it's Brentford, because that's where it should be. If, he, if he's really where he is, then that should be Brentford. Uh, heads off down there. Approaches Harlow, sees North Weald Airport, which has been mentioned before in the pre-flight briefing. So he now knows that he's seriously yes. not where he's supposed to be because he understands what North Weald Airport is. This is where he decides to call Farnborough. This is Stapleford from there as well. Yeah, it's further south, just a little bit further south. There he is, over North Weald. He finally called Farnborough Radar for assistance and Phil Farnborough gave him a dedicated squawk code. So his transponder wasn't even switched on. So the, the controllers at um, Stansted didn't even know what altitude he was, so they couldn't make a decision based on any information. They had nothing other than... The transponder, they don't always work. Well... When I, um, in, when, I, I hate to say this, when I was in Florida, same sort of situation, flying into bad weather, yeah. and uh, I clocked it, Orlando airspace, and uh, the, I turned the transponder on and said, it's not working. So it just told me to turn 90 degrees. Yeah. Got well, well, the minute you call a radar controller, yeah. he's going to verify your transponder. He will verify your altitude from the transponder, and, the, and he will give you a squawk. If he doesn't get it, then you are transponderless. Yeah, but he will have primary radar by which he can track you then. That's but he knows that you're talking... Yeah, he, he might give you an identification turn, turn left, right, or whatever, so he can identify you on primary radar. He will stick a little tag on the radar screen next to you, so he's now got you. Yeah. Um, and he's relying on your altitude report, yeah. to, uh, but at least he knows you're there. So, um, yeah, someone said, well, what was the instructor thinking? You know, when you, you know the guy... Um, I don't know if he was doing dead reckoning. I don't know if his dead reckoning plan was uh, checked. I don't know if his instructor told him he had to call Farnborough because this is where, that's what Farnborough is. Farnborough have extended their surface from the west of London all the way around the north and the south all the way around. This is what they're there for, to protect the controlled airspace and pre prevent this sort of thing from happening. So, yeah, what was the instructor thinking? What did he check and send him off on that route? Um, so, um, I've used up most of my time. I'm just going to, um, I've got one final slide to just to close, really, if I can make this go away. On the damn fool that keeps asking these dumb little bit questions, sir. Oh, well. <laughs> oh uh, well, the report. The student part, they couldn't do many. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't take his license away, could they? <laughs> they just recommend further training. <laughs> so anyway, that that's what he did. Um, the the report, the full report of this, you can find. It's on the web if you Google it. It's on. Um, there's a magazine comes out uh, periodically called Clued Up. It's a CAA, that's not CAA, it's a, it's a joint publication for this kind of thing. And there's a full report of what happened in there. But you can find the radar trace on the Fly On Track website. Um, okay, so just to summarize, um, we had a look at planning before flight, studying the chart, planning the route, knowing where we're going to go, knowing what we're looking for, uh, where we're going to get the data to plan our routes. Um, so map reading and doing it on the ground and, and drawing your lines and planning all this is one thing. And we all have a laugh at this student, but actually doing it in the air is really, really, really um, another trick because you've got to fly the aeroplane while doing this and talking on the radio and doing everything else that comes along, all your, pre, all your check, en route checks and all the rest of it. There's a lot going on and uh, you're worried about your weather and mistakes get made. So it's, there's an awful lot that goes into... Um, 
VFR navigation, and when you get in the air, it's an awful lot more. So, you know, those things happen frequently because people haven't really done the practice uh, that they need to do, and they haven't probably done all the planning they need to do, and they haven't really studied their chart. Uh, you don't mind me making another silly point. Yeah, go on. When I was, say, I was taking from the small airfield and flying back to the main airfield, I took off, and do you know you got 150 and 15? I got them mixed up. Yep. I steered, I steered 15 degrees. Not to fly for about five minutes. I realised well, everything, nothing was coming up. Well, that's the other problem with your heading, uh, your your, um, your direction indicator. It's got numbers on it, and you know three zero or or zero, you know, whatever. Th yeah, three zero or three hundred. You know, um, so these things happen. This is what goes wrong. Um, but if you're on top of it uh, and you've got the, you know, your workload is under control, you can you can start thinking about what's going on and what should I be checking. But when you're maxed out. This is when you start making these mistakes. What that guy had on that was expectation bias, what I would call expectation bias. He was expecting things to be there, because his map said they would. Um, he, you should, he wasn't reading from the ground to the map. He was, he was saying, this is what's on the map, and this is what's going to be there. And he had an expectation. And when it turned up, that must be it. Um, and the other thing he didn't do was use the air traffic services available, because it would all gone really well. All he had to do was make a radio call. That is probably all I'm going to cover, so any, any more questions? <laughs>